have honest, real, raw, true conversation and prayer with God. You go down into the water, and when you do, the old person dies. You come up out of the water as a new creation of Jesus Christ. Hey, welcome to Church Experience. Thank you so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Now is a great time to grab your weeklies and head to your seats if you haven't already because the service starts in 90 seconds. I'm here to tell you today that God wants to set you free. Oh yeah. He wants to set you free. relationship with him. Grow in your walk with him. Get closer to him. Spend more time with him because he's better. If you want your life to get better, then get around the one who is better. Get around Jesus. Get around the one who has power to change and transform your life. Get around the one who has the perfect grace for you and the perfect love for you and the perfect joy for your soul. Listen, he is better.
Welcome to CE Online. To get more connected, head over to churchexperience.tv forward slash connect. Please stand and join us as we lift our voices to sing to our God.
Father, we just thank you for who you are, God, for your goodness, Lord. We just thank you for being our protector and giving us that confidence, Lord, to trust you. Thank you, God, for just making a way in our hearts, in our lives, and in this place as we worship you and learn more about you, God. We just love you, God. And just thank you for your presence. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Father, we have come to you in the spirit of worship today, and Father, we have opened our hearts to adore you for how lovely and wonderful you are to us. Now, Father, we pray that you will just fill our hearts and minds with your word to empower us to do big things in your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are concluding our series, Big Dreams and Small Steps. How many of you have, have discovered big dreams as we have been going through this series? Uh, if you haven't, I just don't think that you have been looking for them because God has big dreams and, and big plans for your life. And what I've discovered is we know that he's got those big dreams and big plans in our lives. And, and God says, okay, here they are. Now go. And when God says go, too often many of us say, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We realize that in life today, many people appear to be just standing in the same place. So maybe I need to define simple words like go and no, uh, so that you understand uh, more about these big dreams and small steps. Go means simply to be in motion. It means to be, to be moving forward, to be pressing ahead. So when God tells us to go, it means we cannot just be sitting still happy where we are, but that we are called to be moving forward, to be in motion. No simply means a refusal, 
a denial. So in this case, that refusal is when God says, go, we're refusing to go. When he says you need to, to be in motion, to be moving towards that dream that I have put in your life, we're saying, no, we're denying that, we're negating that, that uh, call that God has put in our lives to go, and we're simply saying no. Now, when we say no in our lives, we, we wonder, why is it that the people say no and they're not moving forward? Well, maybe they're, they're not moving forward for many different reasons. Maybe they don't like change. Maybe they like the way things are. It's comfortable the way they are. And to, to move forward or to go means stepping outside of our comfort zone, so they're afraid of change. So because of that, they say no. Or maybe they don't go forward because they know it's going to take more effort to begin getting into motion. Have you ever been driving your car and the light is red and there's a car stopped at the light in one lane and you're rolling very slowly to the light and it changes green before you come to a complete stop? So you take your foot off the brake and you get a, a head start on the car that was sitting there because it takes more energy to get something that was stopped into motion than it does to continue motion, doesn't it? So if you've been sitting still in motion and God says, go, maybe say, you know what, that's going to take a lot of energy to get started. It's going to take a lot of effort for me to, to push forward and get ahead. And because of that, people say no. Maybe it's because people just simply don't have any aspirations. Or they don't see the dreams God is putting on their heart. Or maybe they, they just don't see the vision that God has for their life or the people's lives around them. And as a result, People just wander around in the wilderness of life, the wilderness of being set in one place, the wilderness of not achieving whatever dream has God put in, in their lives until they finally come to the point where, where they die in that wilderness. Why is that? It's because they are not willing to be obedient to God's will and to step forward when God says, go. Now there's a group of God's people that we're going to take a look at this morning that God said very specifically, go. And when God said go, they said no. And we're going to see what happened to this group of people and what they missed out on and what the, the calamity that they faced because of their refusal was. As we look at this group of people, it's a group of people that we find in the book of Numbers today. And what we realize is that, that God had spoken to His people, the Jewish nation, and for hundreds and hundreds of years, He's been telling them, I have a promise for you. The promise is this, this beautiful new land. Let's just call it the promised land. And this beautiful new land, it's going to be so wonderful. You're going to be so happy there. It's, it's just flowing with milk and honey. And maybe you're not a milk and honey kind of person, so, so maybe you're a slurpy person. So let's say it was flowing with slurpees and you could just wheeze the juice until you die. But he says it's just a wonderful place and, and you are not going to believe the fruit there. The grapes are going to be as big as basketballs. This is my promise to you. This land is going to be yours. And for hundreds of years, people have, have been looking forward to this promise and to get this land. And they have gone through times of slavery. They've gone through times of, of hunger. They've gone through times of desperation. And God finally brings them to the brink of this wonderful land. They're just across the river. And God says, go. And the people go, eh, I don't think so. You know what, let's, let's send some guys over there to check it out first to make sure it's, it's what it's supposed to be. So that's where we pick up the story today in Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 26. And what we see here is, is they had sent 12 spies into this land. There was one spy from each of the tribes of Judah. And they go into this land and for 40 days they spy it out. They check it out, they see what's there, and then they come back to report to the people what they had found, and that's where we find ourselves in the story today. It says these spies come back to Moses and Aaron and to the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly, and they even showed them the fruit of the land. And they gave Moses 
this account. We went into the land which you sent us. And yeah, it does flow with milk and honey. And, and here's the fruit. But the people who live there, oh, they're powerful. And the cities are fortified and they're, they're very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amurites, they live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And as they're giving this report, talking about all of these enemies and how big and how dangerous and how scary they are, I'm sure the people that were listening to this story were starting to murmur and complain and say, oh no, he came all the way out here and now it sounds impossible to grasp. So in verse 30, Caleb, one of the 12 spies, silences the people before Moses. And he says, no, nah, we should go and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him, they said, oh, no, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread amongst the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored, it devours those that are living in it. All the people we saw there, they're of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. We seemed like grasshoppers in their eyes, and we looked the same to them. You see, Moses had been given orders from God to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage and to this wonderful promised land. And God never said to them, maybe I'll give you that land. He never said, you know what, I might give you this land. He didn't say, well, that's a possibility, you know, that you can, can have this land. He didn't say it could happen or it, it should happen. It won't happen. In fact, he said, this is my promise to you, that you will have this land that's flowing with milk and honey. And if God said it, that should have settled it, shouldn't it? Let me put it in language. For today. God says, give me your life and I'll give you eternal life. God says you can have that relationship you desire if you will simply have a relationship with me. God says I can, can free you from the bondage of drugs and alcohol if you'll just surrender to me. You can have that job or that financial breakthrough that you've been chasing if you'll just give yourself to me. You can have peace if you'll surrender yourself to me. And guess what? Just like the Israelites, we say, no. That's okay. We don't think we'll do that. Why is it that we say that? Well, let's look at the story of these spies in the Jewish nation today and see if we can find four reasons that they said no when God said go. Here's the first reason. Reason number one, look at the despair. These spies came back and they, they told their version of the story. The story that they're, they're too big, they're too strong, we, we simply cannot do this. So in Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, it says this, that night all the members of the community raised their voices and they wept aloud. You see, they were filled with despair because they believed these stories that they heard. Despair means that you lose hope, that you don't have hope anymore. And the text tells us that this entire community wept aloud. They despaired because of this report that these 10 men came back with that said, we can't do it, that they'll take us out if we try to go in there. The despair was that these ten spies felt that the Canaanites were, were too strong to defeat. You may be thinking, well, what's that got to do with us? We're not fighting Canaanites today. We don't have to worry about anything like that. Is that true? Well, we are fighting our Canaanites today. What are our Canaanites? Well, the addiction to, to alcohol and drugs could be your Canaanite. Maybe broken relationships in your life is your Canaanite. Maybe it's greed or anger or whatever sin it is that has stopped you from moving forward when God tells you to go is your Canaanite. And those things lead us into a time of despair in our lives that makes us say, no, 
when God says go. Yes, ten spies were telling the people, no, say no when God says go. But you remember the song that we learned in Vacation Bible School or our children's church? There weren't just ten, were they? Twelve men went to spy on Canaan. Ten were bad, but two were good. And those two were Joshua and Caleb. They disagreed with the ten. They were urging the people to, to claim this land. God's promised it to us. We, we've seen God free us from the slavery in Egypt. How could that have happened unless God showed us His power in miracle, miraculous form? We were stuck there between the sea and the Egyptian army, and there was no way out, but, but God got us out. We wandered in the wilderness with no food, and he provided manna and doves from the sky, and, and he got water from a rock. If he could do all those things, don't you think he could get us into this land? Let's go when God says go. But the people's hearts and minds had been filled with despair because of the ten spies that said no. God said it's yours. Should have settled it. The children of Israel, they, they got caught up in the emotions and, and they lost their perspective of God's character. What if they had spent that energy that they put into going backwards into moving forwards? In other words, there's better ways to use your energy than, than complaining against God. So here God tells these Israelites, there it is. There's that beautiful land I promised you. It's right there across the river. You can see it. It's right in front of you. Now go! But the negative report of these ten spies causes the people to lose heart and to weep aloud. They are in despair. They're without hope. And despair always causes us to say no because we feel there's no hope for us. But the Israelites, they should have known better. They had witnessed God's miraculous power time after time. And we should know better. We have witnessed how God works in our lives on a daily basis that should help us overcome despair. And when God says, ask and it will be given to you, knock and the door will be opened to you, seek and you shall find, He is telling us that we should say yes when He says go instead of saying no. So that's the first reason that they said no is because they were filled with despair. Here's the second reason. Look at the division. In verse 2 in chapter 14, it says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You ever hear the expression, don't shoot the messenger? It wasn't Moses and Aaron's idea to free the people from Egypt. It wasn't their idea to get stuck between the sea and the army. It wasn't their idea to be stuck in the wilderness with nothing to eat. It wasn't their idea to have to go into this promised land and defeat all these other people to claim it. They simply were the messenger. They said, God told us to go this way. But when they went that way and they got that news and they were filled with despair, it caused division against them. So they grumbled against the messengers, Moses and Aaron. And it says, the whole assembly said to them, if only we had just died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Do you remember what the, the first thing was that started this whole sojourn? Scripture tells us that God heard the people crying out in Egypt. They were the ones asking to get out. They were the ones asking to get to this promised land. And when God finally brings them to the brink of that promised land, they're weeping aloud. They're saying, we should have just stayed in Egypt. Whose idea was this anyway? But you see, division comes between people in times like that. And division keeps us from being successful in following the dreams that God has in our hearts and our minds. Division means that there's a lack of harmony amongst the people. Division means there is disagreement amongst the people. And the grumbling unbelief of the people is emphasized in this passage where it says all the people, all of the Israelites, the whole assembly, every adult was grumbling in unbelief. Not a single person other than Caleb and Joshua was trusting God. 
These people did not believe that God could possibly lead them into this promised land. They were raising their voices. They were weeping. They were wailing. They were screaming. They were throwing. They were cursing against Moses and Aaron. This negative report caused division amongst the Israelites. So much so that they thought, you know, if we'd just stayed in Egypt, if we would have just died there or in the desert, it would have been better than us trying to, to go into this promised land and be killed by these giant people that are over there. The children of Israel accused the Lord of bringing them to this land only to have them enslaved all over again. They even questioned if it was better just to go back where they started from. They would rather stay in Egypt and be oppressed as slaves than to trust God and to move into the promised land. They were saying no when God was saying go. So what does that have to do with us 2,000 years later? Well, I believe the devil uses the same tactics today to try to defeat us that he used at that time. Causing division amongst God's people is one of the tricks he uses to make us weak so that he can defeat us. He knows that if we're fighting with each other, that we won't put any strength or any attention into fighting against him. Just look at our country today. Can you think of a time when our country has been more divided than we are right now? Why is that? It's because we have leaders that know if we can get people to hate people on the other side, that they'll get all the votes they want on their side. So they spin stories and they fabricate the narrative and they exaggerate the facts until they can get people pointing fingers at each other, saying, no way we're going to do anything with them. That's exactly what the ten leaders in this story were doing. They were afraid. They didn't have any faith to go with God when God told them to go. So they exaggerated the facts. They, they sold fake news. Fake news isn't a new thing. It's been, been going on ever since the day Satan told Eve, it's okay, eat the apple. That was the first fake news. Caused division amongst the people. And it worked perfectly. The people being divided voted with the ten. They decided not to go into this beautiful land that God had promised them. God said go, and division caused them to say no. So when their hearts were filled with despair and they were divided, the third reason they said no was this, and that's to look at the doubters. Doubt had come into their minds now because of these things. In verse 3 in chapter 14, it says, Why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to fall by the sword? Our wives and our children, they're going to be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Doubt means to disbelieve. Doubt means that you, you don't trust what is being told you. The, the negative, the exaggerated, the distorted report of these ten, it caused doubt in the minds of the Israelites and in their hearts. And it spelled the doom of those spies and the children of Israel. Can you imagine what God's heart felt as this was going on? Here He had made this, this beautiful land just for them. I've made everything that you could possibly want right there, flowing with milk and honey, these, these beautiful fruits. I have, have brought you with miracle after miracle after miracle to this place. There it is. Now go get it. And he's probably thinking, oh, they're going to love this. And they're just like, nah, it's all right. I don't, I don't think we want to. Do. How do you think he felt about that? These ten spies, they were declaring that God could not fulfill the promise that He had made to them. He could not give them this promised land. That the, the power of God is not great enough to conquer the enemies that were in the promised land. Well, as I look at this passage, there's, there's three things that stand out to me in this, this passage. The first thing is the spies that spread these evil reports among the people that exaggerated and distorted the truth these spies became stumbling blocks to the other people. The scripture is very clear that we're not supposed to be stumbling blocks to cause other people to sin because we are, are sinning. In 1 Corinthians 8 9, it says, Be careful, however, that 
the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So today when God tells us to go, and for whatever reason we, we don't want to go, and we, we try to find a way to rationalize why we're not going, I mean, sometimes we get all churchy, and we, we even try to find Bible verses that back up our reasons for not wanting to go, and, and it might sound, you know, hey, they know what they're talking about. They use some Bible verses there. We spread false reports, deceive those around us, and by doing so, we become a stumbling block to them by encouraging them to say no when God says go so that we can feel better about our own refusal to go. Yes, 10 of these leaders, they didn't want to go. So they sold their fake news. It caused despair and division and doubt amongst the Israelites. It caused the entire group to say no when God said go. Why would they do that? Why would they deliberately become stumbling blocks like that? And that's the second thing I found in this passage, and that is that people are stumbling blocks because they are overcome with fear. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. These ten leaders, they were afraid, and I can understand that. You know, the, what they saw over there was, was scary. It was large numbers of people that were very strong and their cities were fortified and it, it was quite a daunting task if they were going to go over there and take that land. You see, we become afraid when we lose sight of the fact that, that God is bigger than any enemy that we are fighting against. Yes, people in the land were big. Yes, they were strong. Yes, the cities were fortified. These were all good reasons to be afraid if they had to fight that battle on their own power. But they should have known by now that they're not the ones that are actually doing the fighting. They had witnessed God fight their battles time after time after time. And now they're doubting God's promise to, to give them this land because they're afraid. What about you? Maybe you haven't moved forward when, when God said go in your life because you were afraid of the obstacles or afraid of the enemies that stood in your way. Maybe you have forgotten that God says, do not fear, for I am with you. Fear caused these ten spies and these other adults in the Israelite nation to, to miss out on this wonderful promise. Don't let your fear cause you to miss out on all the promises of God because you said no to God out of fear. The third thing I get from this passage is, and that is that the, the testimony of Joshua and Caleb, the two good spies, came out of strength and courage. And we as believers should have that same strength and that same courage. You ever read Psalm 27? It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it's my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. You see, when you're strong and you're courageous, there's no doubt. God will say, go, and with great anticipation and enthusiasm and courage, you can step forward and take hold of those promises. But that's not what these people of Israel did. Because despair had come and they lost hope because there was now division amongst them. Because they had doubt in their minds that they could take this land. It brings us to the fourth reason they said no, and that's the decision that they made. Look at the decision in verse 4. They said to each other, let's choose another leader and go back to Egypt. You see, decision means to make up your mind. It means to show resolution. And that's what the people of Israel did. They, they made a decision. They made up their mind. We're not going to go. We're going to say no when God says go. And the decision of the Israelites was, was now to have nothing else to do with Moses or Aaron that had, had led them there. 
They were now in total rebellion against God and His appointed leaders. They're now on a rampage. They're storming around. They're making preparations to turn back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron were deemed the fall guys. It's all their fault. And they began aiming their direction, not only at Moses and Aaron, but even at God Himself. They now made a decision to say no when God had delivered them out of Egypt, when He had brought Pharaoh to his knees, when He had taken them through the Red Sea, when He had sent bread and quail from heaven and water from a gushing rock, most of all, God had given them grace and mercy, and the only thing that they could see was the Egypt they wanted to get out of. So the decision they made, because of despair and division and doubt, was to say, let's just go back where we were. They based their decision on the belief that God could not do what He said He would do. And today, we base our decisions on whether we should begin taking steps towards our big dreams that God has promised us on the idea that we don't believe God will do what He said He would do. So, oh, I would never say, say that, Pastor Kurt. Well, I know you wouldn't say those words. You wouldn't say it where people sitting next to you in church today could hear you. But you see, our refusal to begin moving forward when God says go is really us believing deep in our hearts that God won't do what He promised to do. We say, I won't chase after the best that God has for me because I don't believe He's going to give it to me anyway. We say, I'm not going to go after the right relationships in my life because I don't think God will do that. I'm not going to, to go after that job that I really need because I know God won't do that for me. I'm not going to pray to be healed because I don't believe God can do that. I want to be blessed for the best, but I'm not going to ask that because I don't believe God can do that. And all you're thinking, Pastor Curry, that's just a little bit harsh, don't you think? We just wouldn't say anything like that. And I know you wouldn't say that, but if you're sitting still, if you're not moving forward when God says go, the reason for that is that, that you have bought into the devil's fake news and it's caused despair and division and doubt in your mind and it's caused you to make the decision to say no. God told the Israelites, look right there. There it is. You can see it from here. I promised you it's yours. Have faith. Remember my mighty deeds. Remember my great power. Now go and take it. And out of fear, these ten leaders and all those who followed them said no when God said go. What was the result of them refusing to move forward? What happened to them because they said no when God said go? Well, continuing on in that passage in Numbers 14, beginning in verse 36, it says this, So the men that Moses had sent to explore the land, who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it, these men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land, they were struck down, and they died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh survived. You see, refusing God's command to go not only cost them the blessings of that promised land, but it cost them their very lives. What a needless tragedy. It doesn't have to be that way. Are you missing out on the blessings of God in your life? It doesn't have to be that way. When God says go, we have enough history laid out before us. We have seen enough facts. We should have enough faith to say yes, Lord, and take that first step forward. We've been talking about chasing these dreams that God has planned specifically for our lives. But receiving those dreams begins with taking those very first small steps. Are you willing to begin stepping out today? Don't believe the lies of Satan that cause despair and division and doubt in your mind. Believe the words of God. 
When he says, I know the plans I have for you. Not plans to harm you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, that's the truth. And that truth should encourage you to begin taking those small steps towards your big dreams today. You know, I can't think of a, a better dream than the promise God has made to us about our promised land, a land that Scripture tells us there's, there's no more heartache, no more crying, no more pain, a, a land where the streets are paved in gold, a land where we can sing with the angels in the very presence of God. And that's not just something that's a myth, that's a promise that God has made for us, that this promise is yours if you will just take the first step forward. And that first step is simply saying, yes, I want Jesus as my Savior. Yes, I'm going to surrender my will to His will. I'm going to repent of my sins and go in a different direction. I'm going to be baptized into Him to begin this new journey in Him that ends with the wonderful promise that there's eternal life waiting for me in the very presence of God. That is His promise to you. And I stand here saying, go, go. Don't say no. Take that step today. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your great love for us. Father, you have made plans and futures for each one of us. You who have put dreams in our minds and on our hearts. And Father, for too long we have just stood still and said no. So Father, we ask that you, you fill our hearts and minds with faith. Help us to be obedient, to step out and take that first step, to chase after those big dreams that you have made for us. And Father, as we do that, we look forward to the wonderful promises you've made to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before our usher team comes by to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, here's a few important things happening with our CE family. Life is way better with friends and we want to help you to get connected. Here are three ways for you to meet new people at CE. One way to get connected with others here at CE is to go to church with friends, come early, or stay after service to meet new people and get to know your CE family. Another way is by joining a serving team. You can use your gifts and talents to serve God and others while hanging out with some new friends. You can also be a part of life groups. Life groups are a great way to make friends, to grow in community, and to encourage one another. Jot down life groups or serving teams on your response card and let us know you want to get connected. Life is so much better together. As the ushers come forward to collect our response cards and receive our tithes and offerings, we all want to invest our time, energy, and money into what matters. Your giving at CE is making an impact for Jesus week in and week out. Churches are being launched, the community is being served, the next generation is being poured into, and more people are experiencing a full life in Jesus Christ. It's an investment that makes a great return. If you would like to be a part of this movement by helping fuel the vision, we've tried to make the steps easy. You can choose to give in person, online, through our app, or even sign up for recurring giving. No matter how you give, know that your generosity is life-changing for so many people who are able to experience a full life in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your commitment, prayers, investment of time, and financial generosity that truly helps more people experience a full life in Jesus Christ. It's like the way has 
Church Experience Online. Let us know what you thought about this service today. Head over to churchexperience.tv slash connect. That's also a great place for any questions, comments, or prayer requests. We can't wait to see you next week for our brand new teaching series, Fixer Upper. Have a great week.